Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for being here for this very intimate session. And I believe the theme of today was actually around validating your idea. And so I have bad news because I'm not going to talk about it because I think that ideas betray you. I think ideas are not a good starting point to start a large and ambitious business. I think ideas limit you, and I'm going to tell you why. The first problem with ideas is really that, you know, when I speak to people who are about to start a company and they don't know yet what, and I ask them, so why haven't you started yet? And they're like, oh, I don't have an idea yet. And then so, okay, you don't have an idea yet. So, you know, I get sometimes the feeling that people think, you know, you walk over the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, and the sun is shining and Jesus Christ himself is going to tell you, here's a startup idea. And so, so it, it doesn't really work that way. And even if it would work that way, and if you would have that idea, and then you build that idea, and then, you know, what's next? So it kind of really limits you. And then the last thing is that, so um, you build your product, you know, and then th that's kind of your idea. And hopefully it, it helps some users. But if tomorrow someone comes up with, with a better way to solve that user problem, then you're going to be obsolete very fast. And so, as such, I think looking for ideas is really the setup that's going to make you waste a lot of time. And so, instead, what you should be looking for is, is a problem. And it's, that, is, that is really, really important because let's go back to the idea comparison. A problem does not limit you. It doesn't limit you to to how far you can go because, you know, you might put the first solution to the problem, it's not good enough, you put the next one, the next one, the next one, you really try to solve it and you can go very long. A problem also will ensure that you're going to stay flexible on how to solve it. So you don't focus on the solution, you're not married to it. You stay, you're married to the problem, but you're flexible how to get there. So if tomorrow a new technology comes up, a better way to solve the problem, then you're going to stay flexible and you're going to build a new product and you're going to get there faster. And I think, you know, one of the best examples in, in how, how problems are better to build a business than ideas is now you're the new AI technology, generative AI. What if, what if you already have a, a company, you already have a product and you're married to the idea, but suddenly with AI you can solve the problem way faster, then you're actually going to be obsolete very soon. And so instead of cultivating an idea mindset, really cultivate a problem mindset um, and I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. So, so that's an apple as we all know it. And, and there's a problem with that apple, but actually we kind of gotten used to it. You know, there's kind of this little sticker on the apple. And before you eat the apple, you know, you want to get, the, get kind of the, the sticker off the apple and then the sticker sticks on your finger and you might be at the train station and where to put that, you know, that little, little sticker now. It's, it's a bit annoying. But we've gotten used to it. And so it's really important that when you, when you start a company before that, you get a problem mindset in which you start to recognize every single tiny little problem that is out there, even the little sticker on the apple. I'll give you another problem that everyone knows, but we all kind of accepted it and no one's working on it. And it's doors. Your doors are actually my favorite example because doors are really badly designed. The most doors, when you approach them, you don't know whether to push or to pull. And you also don't know whether they are locked or not. And so it's just a, it's just a bad solution for like the problem of you know, you know, separating two rooms and we've gotten used to it. And so it's really important that you get into this, into this problem mindset of finding little problems everywhere and, um, and that you start with it. Now, once you find your problem and you build a company, best case is you're going to spend 20, 30 years building that company. And so potentially the best years of your life. And as such, you know, you don't want to solve any problem. And so I want to speak about what kind of problems to solve. And so behind me is a statistic. I found this, I believe, on some McKinsey uh, report. And so um, essentially they looked across the population of the industrialized countries uh, on, on the planet, and they did the math of all of the time that we are awake. So we're not sleeping, but that we are awake. We actually spend the majority of our time at work. And so, um, you know, you can speak about work-life balance as much as you want. If you don't enjoy the time at work, your life sucks. It's as, as easy as that, so you better make sure 
your time is worth it. And so when you think about problems, I think two things are important, and I'm going to tell you why. The first thing is that, so you know, to, to give you an example, um, in my previous job, I, 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 studied, I studied two companies uh, within an incubator that called, was called Rocket Internet. And, and one company, we've been building the Amazon of Southeast Asia, you know, kind of selling like all kind of consumer goods, like laptops and tablets and books and stuff like that and shipping out to Southeast Asia. And, and it's very hard to do it there because, for example, you have countries like Indonesia and it has tens of thousands of islands. And the problem about it is that you don't have a UPS or a DHL to work there with. So when someone orders a book, you cannot just give it to DHL, you know, put a stamp and it's going to ship. No, you will, get to have, you will need to get the warehouses yourself, you will need to get the trucks, you will need to get the ships to go from island to island, and then little scooters on little island to deliver that book. So it's a really tough and very, very complex to, uh, problem to solve. And we worked day and night on it. So that's the key, we worked day and night. Another company that we did was a marketplace for hairdressers. So you can book your haircut online. We did it in Europe. Very simple. You ask a hairdresser, you want to become a part of the marketplace, you know, get extra revenue. They say, yes, that's it. That's the business. Significantly less complex. But it was always the same amount of work. And so the learning from that is you may as well tackle a very large and complex problem. Anyways, you're going to work you know, a lot of it, so you may as well tackle a large and complex problem. I'll give you uh, another example, actually from my former boss, and he told me once, you know, Daniel, you have, you have two options. Option one is, you know, you, you start a restaurant, let's say you start a pizza shop, and option one is you have one pizza shop. And running a pizza shop is hard, you know, you don't get labor, and people get sick all the time, and you're going to work day and night because it's hard to run a restaurant. Now, option two is, you have 20 pizza shops. Are you going to work more than that? No. You're going to work the same amount of time, and so you better do the big one. You know, you only live once, so, so take a big and complex problem. Now, the second point is that there's, there's big problems that are less important, and there are big problems that are very important. So, I'll give you another example. Um, in particular, when it, when it comes to companies, you know, there's, there's companies that maybe they try to solve for education. You know, make education accessible, and education inaccessibility in general is a very large issue on, uh, on the planet. So that's an important problem, and these companies can become successful. And there's other companies, you know, and I enjoy those companies, and where you can order shoes online. And I think it's convenient. I don't like going to the store, and then shoes get delivered to your home. It's fantastic. But the question is, is that problem so important? And will you want to spend your life solving that problem. So I think those two things are important. Take a large problem, because anyways, you're going to work your butt off. And second of all, um, take an important problem. And so there are many people ask me, okay, how do I find a large and important problem? And there's many ways to find them. And so as an example, you know, if you go to the United Nations website, that's usually a pretty good source for large and important problems. And they have these, you know, 17 sustainable development goals, you know, and it speaks about education and equality and, and climate change and food security and, and these, these kind of things. And so these are large and important problems, but they're likely too large to build a company around. So what I always recommend people is like, you know, take a large one. So I'm going to give you an example of what, what we did at Choco. Is we said, okay, you know, climate change is interesting. Okay, so where does climate change come from? It comes from CO2. Okay, where does CO2 come from? You know, 25% come from electricity. So you're already seeing, okay, there's something to solve. That's a problem. 25% come from the food system. Oh, that's, that's also massive. And so on, and so on, and so forth. And you get it. And so I think it's really important that, you know, you take something high level, that is a big problem, and you actually leave your house, you go out. I think that's a picture of the university library here in Helsinki. And you read on the problem, and you try to get more into the detail until you find something that is a bit more tangible. So let's say, you know, climate change, you find it interesting. And then from climate change, you go to CO2. And from CO2, you maybe go through energy. And then in, in energy, you know, what's the problem? You know, we use maybe too much oil, too much uh, coal. So let's, you know, do new, let's, let's try to fix that. And suddenly it becomes more tangible. So you start from a big one, and you, you kind of drill it down, and it becomes more tangible. And kind of that, you know, for example, fixing energy, that usually becomes the company vision. 
So, and you can, you know, you can call it, you know, fixed energy, you can call it, you know, enable sustainable energy, you can call it differently and positively. But it's really important that you start at high level. And I think um, Armin, before what he said when he was introducing me, he spoke about fundraising. So at this conference, uh, and you're going to hear some speakers that have bootstrapped, but I think most of people here usually try to raise money. And if you're trying to raise serious money, you will need to have a seriously big vision. And so if you can go to a VC and you can tell them your journey, oh, there's this big problem, you know, like climate change. And we looked at it very methodically. It comes from CO2 and CO2 comes from energy production. And this could be, you know, the kind of the sub problem that we're trying to solve. You know, that gets people excited. They see you're ambitious. They see you probably need 20, 30 years to solve it. They also see, because we just need to think, you know, 10 years ahead. So in 10 years, will you still be able to grow? In 10 years, will you yourself as the founder still have enough ambition, uh, en en enough grit to, to pull through? And so when you have the kind of big problem, also in VCs want to invest in more because they see you, you have kind of have a long-term approach, you know, as opposed to like a small idea um, that, that you execute and then sell and then that's it. And it's actually also what we need. We need in Europe more founders that want to do something for 20, 30 years. And so you got a big one. And then, you know, what I always see is that people are like, yeah, I want to work on it. I'm afraid someone is going to copy me. I'm afraid someone is going to copy me. And so they tell no one. So do the opposite. You got to go out there and you have to tell everyone the problem that you find interesting. And a couple of beautiful things will happen. You know, every third person that you tell about the problem or the space that you're trying to solve, they will knew someone working in there. You're going to meet this person. You're going to tell them again. They're going to know another person. Just go out there. And, and spread the word up, and it, it, you're just going to continue, and you have to go out. Don't stay in your room at the computer. There's no value inside. You have to go out and, and speak to those people um, and tell everyone about it. So don't think someone's going to copy me. You have to tell everyone. And then eventually, you get deeper into it. So we can go back to the, to the, to the Choco example. So at Choco, we study you know, climate change, CO2, food system, it's around 25% is 24% of all, all, all CO2. You go deeper. Where is it coming from? Oh, we have nearly 50% food waste, which means 50% of the CO2 is unnecessary in the first place. All right. Suddenly, you, you get to something that is more tangible to then actually build a solution later on, and, and, and you continue. But, but that kind of more tangible, that will become your mission, kind of the thing that you do. You know, it could be like, you know, um, Make ordering a cab, you know, faster. Make demand prediction automatic. Make design better, whatever. So, so it, it becomes a bit more tangible. That's kind of what you're going to do every day, but you don't forget kind of the big picture vision that you're going to need in order to build a company long term. I'll give you an example. So for us, we started with this food waste topic, and then it was like, okay, you know, where's it coming from, and, and, and what should we do about it? And we just said, hey, you know, Let's just speak to everyone we, we, um, we, we can. And at some, that picture is in Singapore. And at some point, I was living in Singapore. And I visited more than 50 restaurants every single day. I was just walking, and, and it's painful, right? Because you walk inside the restaurant, you're like, ah, oh, yeah, hey, guys, I want to start a business. I have a question. They have no time for you. But eventually, if you do it 50 times a day, you know, 10, 20 people will start to talk to you. And then you, you have to sit down and really observe kind of the, the process, the day-to-day, -day, the boring stuff that they do every single day. Um, and so, for example, what we found out is that, you know, the restaurant at the end of the day, after they clean the kitchen at, at, at 11 p.m., what do they do? Is they call their supplier, so the, the company where they buy their ingredients, and they leave a voicemail. And they say, you know, I need you know, five limes and 20 bananas and 15 pounds of chicken breast for tomorrow. And so what happens is that the supplier wants to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning. They listen to the voicemail. And they, they just understood, oh, he wants three limes. But usually he, want, he wants lemons. So maybe it's actually lemons. And he said three. Is it three kilograms, three pieces, three nets, three boxes? What is it? And so what happens, a lot of mistakes occur, and then when you bring limes instead of lemons, it goes to the trash because you can't return food, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And suddenly, you get to the root cause of the problem that there's these little tiny transactions that, that, that cause waste. And so you have to just go out there over and over and over again. 
And, um, and only once, once you got to that nitty-gritty problem, and you're like in the, in the lowest level of detail, only then the easy part starts, which is thinking of a solution, you know, the idea. And probably it's like, you know, 90% problem, 10% idea, because then idea solutions are usually easier to find than the right problem to work on. Um, and I think what is really, really important, so uh, I give you an example. Last week I was sitting with two, you know, young founders, they started a company uh, together in the biodiversity space, and, and they have this product that they have out there, and so I asked them, okay, so how many users did you show the product yet? You know, and, and one of them was, she was like, oh, no, we should launch now, and it's ready. And, and the other one is, you know, it's like, no, no, it's not ready. It's just not there. We're going to need, you know, one, one, two more months. You know, kind of that perfectionist, and maybe also that, that shyness, uh, um, uh, if you want. So, and, but what I could tell them already is you have spent, you have wasted months and months of budget, of development, of a product that no user has ever seen or has validated. So once you have the, the idea, the solution, if you want so, don't even touch code, don't even think of it. I give you an example how, how, how we did it. So my co-founders and me, none of us is a designer, and so we designed our first app on, on PowerPoint. And then of course it looked ugly and it, and, it, and it doesn't look perfect. It was also 2018, all the cool design tools haven't been there at that point. But so, so, so we kind of make the screen uh, for our first products and how a restaurant can, can order waste-free and how supplies to demand prediction, stuff like that. And then I was actually you know, back home in, in Berlin and I would walk into restaurants and I would you know, show them a screenshot of that PowerPoint ugly design. I say, you know, what do you think? And then you, know, you get kicked out and you kicked out more and more, you get called names and it's, it's part of the journey, it's fine. But we did probably 50 iterations every single day because, because you know, the user is like, oh, that doesn't work. Okay, no problem. You go out, you know, you can sit on a park bench, you know, change the design, next restaurant. Oh, they kick you out again, that doesn't work. Change the design a bit on the park bench, next one, next one, next one. You get 30 to 50 iterations every single day. If you build for larger companies, like, like we're doing now at, uh, at Choco, you might not get 50, 30 iterations a day, but for sure you get five iterations a week. You know, when you speak, to, when large enterprises are supposed to be your, are supposed to be your customers. And it's very important to do it purely on design. There is, there's no way you can 100% understand the user and understand which idea is going to fly before the user has actually seen it. So don't even touch code. We probably did like 300 iterations before we, before we started coding. And it's going to make you so much faster. And by the way, it's also going to make you raise money so much easier. Because when you get in front of the investor and you're early stage, and the investor is going to ask you, okay, so tell me about the problem you're solving. You know, when you start with the big vision and then, and then the mission and then kind of the, the, um, the, the product. If you can tell the investor a hundred anecdotes of how you spoke to people and what they have feedback to you, the investor is going to think, okay, this team is taking stuff serious. They spoke to, to hundreds of customers, which by the way is your lead list for once you have a product, you can, you can, you, 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 you can sell to them. And it's, and it's also going to make you much more confident. And a particularly early stage investors, they want to, they, they, they're just checking for the founder if they're confident enough to do en uh, enough of their homework. Um, and so it's really, really important that first you don't start um, before you don't start with an idea of a problem, but second, once you have the idea, once you have the solution, don't start to code until you get you know, many, many iter uh, iterations in. It's way faster to iterate, obviously, on design than, than on, on actually code. And so I guess actually my um, my last message uh, for, for today is, you know, don't be shy. Don't be that, that founder team that says, oh, it's not perfect yet, we, sh we shouldn't launch yet, no. Just go out there, show the world something ugly. I always, always, always tell, tell my founders, like, okay, is it ugly? Yes, okay, so now's the time to ship. You want to ship while it's ugly, because it's not your taste who's, which is going to decide if something is beautiful, but it's the user's taste. And so as such, go out there as early, um, as, early as possible. Um, and then I think you're going you're gonna to build a, uh, a fantastic company that not only is trying to solve a big problem in the long run, um, 
but also now you will start with product market fit um, very, very early. And so there is um, uh, one last thing I want to, um, I want to give you, and that's, and that's actually back, back to the idea example. So um, uh, I think it's very easy to go out there and, and look what's working already. Okay? And there's many companies that are, that are being hyped, in particular over the last you know, five, six, seven years, we saw many hype companies. You know, quick commerce, boom, hype. We had all of these little bikes everywhere across Europe and the scooters, boom, hype. And so, so, so all of it really happened. But if you go over there to the other stage, or if you stay at this stage here, you're going to see none of the founders presenting to you of which the companies actually have been successful followed the hype. They all found a problem that is worth solving. Um, and, and they stuck to it. And so, uh, and that is what we need more in Europe. We need more founders that, you know, find a problem that's really important and is large and stick through it for 20, 30 years. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>